John chapter 6. We're going to be talking about what it means for Christ to be really present in the Eucharist. And we're going to be talking about the Eucharist in the light of the whole biblical development through the whole scriptures. Try to see how the scriptures tie together. We just saw how Genesis 3.15 ties together that fundamental theme of scripture. And we looked at the Blessed Mother again. When we're talking about the Eucharist, I think it's very easy to get too quickly into a, a squabble over the meaning of a particular verse or passage and miss the big picture of what is going on. Let me begin a little bit by a personal testimony to maybe show what the Catholic belief isn't. In fact, I was supposed to do something for the tape and I didn't do it. Where's my catalog? I lost it. Does anybody have a catalog? Behind me. There it is. Okay. I wanted to read, and, and I just wanted to get this on the tape. The book entitled, This is My Body, An Evangelical Discovers the Real Presence by Mark P. Shea. Let me read just what I wrote in our catalog about this. A small but very profound book. Outside of the sixth chapter of St. John, there is not a better resource to share with a Protestant friend about the Eucharist. Catholics need to know how to share about the Eucharist with friends who have left the church, since the Blessed Sacrament is the strongest attraction to Catholicism for those outside the church. This small book is also a useful aid for the 50% of Catholics who do not understand the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, actually, I have to modify this. This catalog is in error. I don't know if you're aware, but there is a major problem within the Catholic Church in this country that of those Catholics who are attending Mass regularly, not those who on a poll say, yes, I'm a Catholic and haven't shown up in 10 years, but Catholics who are attending Mass, extensive polling showed that those Catholics who are over 65, who have kind of their lives go back before a lot of the catechetical funny business started in the 60s and such, only 51% of that age category believes in the Catholic doctrine of the real presence in the Mass when given some alternatives the three of the four alternatives are the Protestant view. 51% of the over 65 age bracket, only 51% believe in the Catholic doctrine. When you start going down in age, you're getting down to two-thirds, at least two-thirds or more of younger Catholics do not hold the Catholic belief. And these are younger Catholics who are attending Mass on a regular basis. The amazing thing in the United States in polling with Lutherans, there are more Lutherans, a higher percentage, I should say, of Lutherans who believe in the Catholic doctrine than there are Catholics who believe in the Catholic doctrine. We are in deep, serious crises because, as the New Catechism says, the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Catholic life. This is the center. This is the hub. This is the magnet. This is, upon, this is the sacrament of all sacraments. This is why you are a Catholic. In fact, if you were ever asked a question, I can remember I was sitting uh, on an airplane in Fort Myers, Florida, waiting to take off, and the stewardess came up to me and said, excuse me, would you like to sit in first class? And I barked at her and said, no, of course. No, I said, sure, I'd love to sit in first class. <laughs> I was up there and I think, boy, this is great. The Lord's rewarding his servants, you know. I had all this work to do. I wanted to kind of spread out because I was doing a new series of talks for the Diocese of Peoria and such. And so I thought, well, I'll wait till after breakfast because it's going to be a real nice one up here in first class and all that. And so I waited till after breakfast and I was just ready to start pulling out my notes and getting to work when this very nicely dressed woman seated next to me started pulling out her books. And I'm pretty well aware of uh, the uh, tools used for serious scripture study, and she was pulling out some pretty serious tools. I started kind of going like this, like you do with people sitting next to you reading something on an airplane. And I saw she was doing some pretty serious scripture study, getting ready for a talk, very obvious. So I said, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, now I know I'm in first class. So we started talking, and, and she 
turned out to be the wife of a nationally known Assemblies of God minister. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are thousands upon thousands of Catholics who have left the church and have found a new home in Assemblies of God churches, particularly many of those who've gotten um, involved in the Catholic charismatic renewal have found their way right outside the church into the Assemblies of God. So I heard this, and so I, I, it was coming into very clear focus while I was in first class that day. So I said to her, well, you know, that's interesting. After my uh, adult conversion, I attended Assembly of God College. She goes, oh, really? I said, yes. And we kind of traded some names because she knew the institution and all that. I said, well, yes. And um, I was an evangelical minister, and I described the denomination. She knew, oh, good. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> Now I'm a Catholic. Thud. <laughs> well, that was it. I had no preparation to do the rest of the flight. I had all this work I thought I was going to do. She hardly did any until we were just ready to land the airplane. And we got in, you know, all around. And we talked about all these type of things. And it was a, it was a very good talk. It wasn't uh, argumentative at all. But finally, I heard this question. This question is like the Howard Hughes airplane hangar opening up before you that you could fly this whole plane through or bring a set of semi trucks through side by. This is the kind of question that you live for. OK, you wait for. She said to me. Because bottom line, I had, quote, lived all the experiential type background that, that she was a part of. She said, well, what do you have now as a Catholic? that you didn't have as a Protestant. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Hard to contain myself. Okay. At this time, you need to remember this and write these three things down. You need to remember if you have a question like that, there are three things you need to mention. The first, and don't forget this, is the Eucharist. Then the second is the Eucharist. And then the third is the Eucharist. Write it down. <laughs> Write it down. I'll tell you, we moved to a new home just last summer. And we found out that, uh, t and we only have eight homes on our street. And two of those, or about eight homes, two of those are homes of nice Protestant families who happen to be former Catholics. And one of the neighbor girls was over in one of my daughter's bedroom who have heard me do these kind of talks Right. And uh, came in, saw our Bible and says, what kind of Bible is that? And it's a Catholic Bible. And, and you know, well, how's it different from a Protestant Bible? And my daughter said, you know, well, Martin Luther took seven books. out. No, they can't do that. <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. And then the question came, well, you know, my dad was a Protestant minister and stuff. And then we became Catholics. She says, well, why did you do that? And later at dinner, my daughter said, why well, didn't I, I said, what do you say? The Eucharist, the Eucharist, the Eucharist. I mean, you have to have something to say. Now, there's a hundred things to say. That's why it's easy to choke. So get it in your mind. What do you want to say? And that's the Eucharist, the Eucharist, the Eucharist. It's the center of the faith. I said to this woman, I said, I know you. You love Jesus Christ. You have a heart that hungers for Jesus Christ. You're in a denomination that started out of a renewal movement. You want a first-hand touch with Jesus Christ. Says, I know you. If you thought Jesus Christ was physically touching down in your hometown, I don't care what was on your schedule, you would be there, wouldn't you? I said, this is the exact claim being made by the Catholic Church. It's not just that Jesus is there and we think about him and that's true it's not just that jesus is with us via the holy spirit in our hearts and that's true but jesus is present in the eucharist in a most profound and unique way not denying the other presence that uh protestant and catholic christians can enjoy but he is present in the eucharist in a most unique and profound way as he is in no other way on earth during this age you see, Jesus said, lo, the last thing he said before he left, lo, I am with you always. He didn't say a thought of me is with you always. An experience of me is with you always. I, I am with you 
always. And if in the Old Testament, the spirit of Yahweh, this glory cloud would travel with the children of Israel, which marked them out from all peoples on the earth. And that was simply a shadow of what the new covenant you're going to say we're believing in a real absence between the two advents, between the first and second coming of Jesus is just the thought of him with us. No, he is with us. And how does he dwell in the midst of his people? It's in the Eucharist. And Protestant people, generally the most anti-Catholic of the bunch, that tend to be basically your evangelical and your fundamentalist. And by the way, the fundamentalists and evangelicals are not more anti-ecumenical um, in the sense of being bigoted. or anti People say, well, mainline Protestants are more charitable. No, they're not. Okay, I'm going to get in trouble probably, but no, they're not. They generally don't know their faith as well. And so they can get along with anybody because they don't know what they believe. Okay? People leave those churches and then go to evangelical or fundamentalist Protestant churches. They know their faith. They, they, because, believe me, mainline Presbyterians today don't carry on at all the way John Calvin carried on. Okay? As far as the anti-Catholic uh, uh, type of, of spirit within them. But in the fundamentalist and, and evangelical circles, they do. And since they believe that Catholics aren't going to heaven... It's on the basis of charity that they try to get you to come out of the Catholic Church. It's not because they're mean or cruel or bigoted. It's because of their charity. They're willing to cross. It's misguided charity. And on the same token, these people are not sinister, evil. You know, you might just take it as that because of their anti-Catholicism. It's because of their love for Christ being extended to their neighbor. They're trying to rip you off of the church. Okay? What you need to turn right around and doing and recognize that these people love God. And what you appeal to is not just their intellect or not just an experience or not just squabbling over some uh, isolated remote doctrine. You want to get them right to the center of the Catholic faith. And that center is Christ. Christ is the point of everything. He's the center of the universe. He's the center of heaven. He's the center of the worship. He's the center of the liturgy. He's the center of our lives. And these people who love God, you build on that. You don't destroy that and reject it. You take their love for Jesus Christ and expand it. Because basically Catholicism isn't as much anti-Protestant as it is the fullness of the faith. And so take that love for Christ you see within Bible Protestants and show them this is the opportunity before them. Okay? Now, how do you do this? Um, we're going to do it right here. I think this is an initial way because John chapter 6 is the best place to start on this. And along with John 6, I mentioned Mark Shea's book. I need to mention a third. And that's the New Universal Catechism. The second pillar or the second section of the catechism deals with the seven sacraments. And the Eucharist in there is very well done. I just completed a uh, three hours. I just had a most marvelous time uh, going through preparing some new tapes uh, on the new catechism and that section on the sacraments. But the new catechism, Mark Shea's book, and particularly John chapter 6. That's where you want to turn. You want to be able to find the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And as I said to folks last night, when Catholics can open to chapter and verse, make sure you have your cellular phone in your back pocket, and you just pull it out and dial 911 as your Protestant friend goes into cardiac arrest, having seen a Catholic can find chapter and verse, right? Okay. So, let's turn to John chapter 6 and see what this chapter talks about. There's, let me give you an outline of John chapter 6, of just what is being talked about. If you have a Navarre Bible, it, this outline is suggested for you, the way it's broken up in there. But John chapter 6, if you would take the first 14 verses, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, it's talking about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle bread... Of the feeding of the 5,000. That's John 6, 1 through 14. And this is approximate. This isn't, you know, any area to become overly rigid. But it's just an idea to get an outline. How does the thought develop here? In John chapter 6, verse 16 to 24, you have an interlude on the miracle at sea. You can ask me about that in Q&A if you want uh, a little, maybe why that's in the middle of a chapter dealing with the Eucharist. Okay. And then chapter 6 and verse 30, you have the second major section. Again, a bread miracle, but this time from the Old Covenant, the manna. 
Jesus just feeds the 5,000. And they say, well, look, Moses gave us the manna. What are you going to do to top that type of thing? So you have a second bread miracle mentioned in John chapter 6. 6 verse 30, talking about the manna. It's the second main section. And then you have finally the last section in John chapter 6, starting in verse 48, where Jesus begins talking about the Eucharist, the ultimate bread miracle. Let me just read to you some of those verses from John chapter 6, starting verse 48. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that, which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, in the original Greek, amen, amen. This is a solemn covenant oath, the double amen. Amen, amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not such as the fathers ate and died, talking about the manna. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then if, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. There are some of you who do not believe. For from the first, Jesus knew those who did not believe and who it be, would be that would portray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. After this, John six sixty six. after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went with him. Jesus said to the twelve. Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now let's look at John chapter 6. I gave you the overview. First thing that happens is that Jesus comes and feeds the 5,000. Now, this feeding of the 5,000 should not become a detached thought from the Eucharist. Because in the other Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 occurs kind of in a chronological order because the institution of the Eucharist doesn't come to the latter chapters of the Gospels. The, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 comes earlier. So, I had a tendency as a Protestant to detach that miracle. I believed it happened, but I didn't see it synthesized with the Eucharist and how it fit in. Because the feeding of the 5,000, according to John 6, you see, is a prefiguring of some greater miracle that Jesus would do. And let me just pause for a minute. People say, some, some Protestants say, that St. John doesn't talk anything about the Eucharist. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians, St. Paul and the other three gospel writers all mention explicitly the institution of the Eucharist. And there are those who claim that St. John doesn't say anything about the Eucharist. And to that I say, pure baloney. St. John was the one, while Jesus was instituting the Eucharist, who had his head on the heart of the Son of God. 
symbolically showing the one on earth who was closest to the heart of Christ and what was going on during that time. While the other gospel writers tell us externally what is going on during that time, only St. John records in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, five of the most profound chapters found anywhere in Holy Scripture are all in the context of what went on in the upper room while Jesus was instituting the Eucharist. So those chapters need to be read in the context of a Eucharistic setting because they have a Eucharistic context. And you rip that apart and you talk about answered prayer, you talk about life in the spirit, you talk about abiding in Christ. And if you talk or Christian unity, if, or if you talk about learning how to love, if you talk about any of those things apart from the Eucharist, you're doomed to fall on your face. Because Jesus said, unless you abide in me, you can do nothing. He said that in John 15. And right here in John 6, he tells us this is how we abide. And so you have John 13 through 17. It's talking in Eucharistic context. And John chapter 6 is talking about a Eucharistic context, which I'm going to show you. So it's baloney that John doesn't talk about the Eucharist. Of all people, he's the most profound. But he's writing to people who have the Holy Spirit, one, and two, are living a full Christian life, which means they're in a, a, a regular Eucharistic communion. And so this stuff is obvious as day to them. It's those who have been cut off, perhaps can't see it. All right. I don't know where I got there, but let's get back to where we started. <laughs> The feeding of the 5,000, that's where it was. This is leading up. So we want to see how the feeding of the 5,000 connects with the Eucharist. Jesus fed the 5,000. And then the people go, whoa, this is something. I mean, and then we find this little later on in the chapter, the second section. So they said in verse 30, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? <laughs> Can you believe it? Just feeding 5,000 people miraculously and then say, well, how about a sign so we can believe? I mean, get with it. But in any case, but see, this is where John, a case of unbelief or misunderstanding, gives rise to further clarification and depth of teaching. And he said, what work do you perform? He says, our fathers ate man in the wilderness. As is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the true bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Lord, give us this bread always. Okay, we move from stage one, the feeding of the 5,000, a Eucharistic context prefiguring the Eucharist. We then move to stage two. They're saying, we saw the feeding of the 5,000. Now, we recognize as Jewish people rooted in God's word that there would be another one after Moses. There would be another great leader, a great prophet like after Moses, the Messiah. And so if Moses was the type foreshadowing the Messiah, the Messiah would have to do something greater than Moses. And what they just saw, if you appreciate feeding 5,000 with lunch for one, you would think, is that greater? And no, it's not in the sense of the miraculous nature of what went on. One of the reasons we don't appreciate the New Testament fully is because we don't understand the Old Testament well enough. There's a reason why God had the Old Testament written and come before the New Testament and why the whole thing is a book. So now we're just going to put this talk on pause. And we're going to go back and look at the manna to see the miraculous nature of the manna. Because what Jesus is going to be talking about in verse 48 and following is a contrast to the miraculous nature of the manna. And if you want to see how great whatever it is Jesus is talking about, you have to see how great the manna was in the Old Testament. If you have this teeny little conception of what the manna miracle was, well, then you might be tempted to have a very shallow view of what goes on in what Protestants call the Lord's Supper or Catholics sometimes call it that as well or the Eucharist. So let's go. The manna chapter of the Bible is Exodus 16. And if you have a copy of Scripture, it's the second book of the Bible. Exodus chapter 16. 
And we're going to start with a, um, a brief Hebrew uh, lesson here. It says in Exodus 16, verse 14, And when the dew had gone in the morning, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as hoarfrost. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to teach you how to say, What is it? in Hebrew. Ready? Manu. What is it? Manu. What is it? That's how man got its name. All right. Now. Now, this, no, but see, this is very significant. This is where, again, you need to keep your antenna up when you approach scripture. The answer was given by Moses in the following words in verse uh, 15, last part of 15. And Moses said to them, it is the bread of which the Lord gives you to eat. But really, every time you said Manu, Mana, you're asking a question. And sometimes in Scripture, for instance, the most profound thing that I know of in the Bible, the question, it's brought up in Job. And anybody who understands Job knows that there's no answer in Job. And the question is, why do the righteous suffer? Which is a question that Job asked God. And his friends tried to answer and failed miserably. And if you understand Job properly, it ends with simply a question mark. And you don't get any answer until about 2,000 years later. You don't get the answer to why do the righteous suffer until the righteous one is suffering on the cross. Why does the righteous one suffer? I mean, as sinners... We deserve it. But yet God, rather than giving us what we deserve, God himself suffers. And he answered Job's question with a question. And then we come to the New Testament and we see Christ on the cross. But to really understand the cross, to me, isn't as much as an answer as it is a further question. I don't have any answer to why God sent Jesus to suffer. I have no answer. Just a question. I wouldn't do it. And in the depths of most, I'd say every human being, if you really got to the nitty gritty, we wouldn't do it. But that's what God did. I don't know why, but I'm getting very anxious to get to know him for all eternity. To begin to comprehend the depths of that answer, which I will never get. Because God is so deep, it's going to take eternity to begin to get to know this answer. I believe we're at the same thing here. This isn't just a little Hebrew word game. What is it? This is a neon sign in Hebrew. What is it? What's going on? What's being prefigured here? And when we get fast forward now into John chapter 6, you're about to see what it is. Do you understand? It's something profound. This is one of the big question marks by its very name of manna to point us towards the New Testament. Now, what went on in this miracle? It says in verse 16, gather it, each one of you, as much as you can, and take an omer apiece according to the number of persons whom each of you has in his tent. Now, how much is an omer? Well, you don't know. You have to play detective here. But an, they, the Bible itself tells you what an omer is if you go to verse 36. Verse 36 says, an omer is the tenth part of an ephath. <laughs> really helps you out, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay, this is a time where a, a Bible dictionary can become extremely helpful. Okay, okay, what an, uh, an omer is, is approximately six to eight pints, or one half, one and one half to two quarts, approximately six to eight point, pints, somewhere in there. Okay, that's the measure that was given to each person. Now, how many people were there? And this is fun. In fact, I've even seen very conservative Catholic scholars just lose it here. Because they believe that this was some ooze that kind of came off a tree. Okay? And it's fine because you get a little ooze for a couple dozen people. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. How many? There were 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. 600,000. Now, they say, oh, well, the writer here, uh, actually, they had a slip and put in a couple extra zeros. Maybe it's 60,000, you know, 
because you can only get so much ooze out of these trees, <laughs> trying to have a naturalistic explanation for this. And they're missing the point. Okay? There are 600,000 men, so double that. You're up to 1.2 million if you're talking about men and women. Now, also, according to Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, the whole reason this Exodus took, took place is that it says, The descendants of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly, and they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. You see, Margaret Sanger wasn't visiting uh, the children of Israel in Egypt. She wasn't trying to uh, have kind of like her anti-child mentality spread around the children of Israel. The children were received as a good. And they multiplied so much that when Pharaoh saw this, he was afraid they were going to take over things. So he said the genocide program on, on Hebrew male children. And this kind of gave rise. Of course, Moses being one saved through all this became the deliverer. So you had vast numbers of children. You had exceedingly large, unusually large families, even for that part of the world and that part, time of the world when family size was much larger than today. But let's just, for sake of argument, just be ultra conservative. And I'm, I mean, we're talking way in excess here of four million children that would have been present. But let's just cut that down to, say, uh, in half. Just say that we had here 1.2 million adults and add on to maybe a grand total of 2 million people. I'm just doing this for sake of argument because I personally believe at minimum it was double that. We're talking at least 4 million. But I'm just, so somebody says, no, it's 3.8 or something, fine. Let's just cut it down to 2 and get the business. <laughs> what would it look like for 6 pints of manna? Remember, we're talking 6 to 8 pints, so I'm taking the low figure. 6 pints of manna, what would that look like coming for 2 million people? Daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, this is what it would look like. You would kind of get out of your tent, stretch, take a look at your camel, see how they were doing. And then you would look up and off in the desert. Uh, now, they didn't have freight trains back then. This is just an illustration. You would see a freight train coming, chugging along through the desert, bringing you your daily supply of manna you know, with great excitement. Now, you're feeding two million people. This would take a freight train when it pulled up. You would see that this freight train not just had one or two cars or even three cars or five cars, not just 10 cars or 15 cars or 20 or 25 cars, but a freight train hauling 30 freight loads worth of manna. And you go, whoo! And just as you kind of recovered from seeing this freight train pulling 30 cars coming in, you'd see another freight train out in the desert coming in and this one also pulling a train 30 cars long and pulling up next to it with your daily bread you're thinking whoa get a load of this and when you just got done with that you saw a third train coming with 30 cars of manna and a fourth and a fifth a sixth a seventh an eighth a ninth 10 freight trains pulling 30 freight loads worth of manna daily for 40 years I tried to figure out how much all this would be for 40 years, and it ran out of place on the calculator. Okay, we're ready for John chapter 6 now. <laughs> now, you see what's going on? Jesus just fed 5,000. Now, are you really the Messiah? You're going to have to be something greater than Moses. Now, this is something fundamental. In a sense that, again, we're not talking about the interpretation of one or two verses. This is the primary drift of Scripture, and it goes like this. The Old Testament, you move from shadow to substance. You move to promise, something in its origin, to its fulfillment. You move from lesser to greater. These Jewish people were right on target, because you needed a someone greater than Moses. So if you're going to top Moses... You would need a bread miracle, not just the feeding of the 5,000, as great as that was, but you're going to have to top the Manu. What is it in the Old Testament? Feeding a couple of million people daily where there is nothing to live on. They would be literally dead as we would be spiritually withering and drying up without the Eucharist in the wilderness that God has us in right in the 1990s, you see. But what is then, therefore, greater going to occur in the new covenant? And at that point, 
Jesus begins teaching just where I read from you in John chapter 6 and starting in verse 48, where he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life in you. How is he going to top the manna? He is going to give of himself. And who is he? God, come in the flesh, is going to give of himself. And of course, it's not a question of, because the question is, well, how does God do this? That's the wrong question. Who is doing this? If it is the God who can create all things out of nothing, well, then perhaps he can do something that we can't conceive of. I mean, have you ever sat down and thought how you'd make something out of nothing? Think about that for about three hours as you're trying to go to sleep tonight. I mean, have you ever tried that? I mean, perhaps we're not fully appreciating what our creator is. And then try to think about what it would be like to get that much manna daily to depend on your very life for God and seeing all this come up with for hundreds of thousands of people. And now Jesus then moves in. And then they say, well, this is a hard saying. And what does Jesus come back and say? Um, truly, truly, I say to you, he doesn't soften it. He becomes more explicit. I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life in you. Now, of course, the disciples kind of squabble. And they said, verse 60, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Now, I'll tell you the Protestant comeback to all of this. They take one verse out of context and make it a pretext. They'll take John 6, 63. But, 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 John 6, 63 says, but, 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 John 6, 63 says this. It is the spirit that gives life and the flesh is of no avail. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So they say, oh, see here, it says spirit and life. That means we're supposed to take these words in a spiritual sense, a symbolic sense, a metaphorical sense. They take this one verse and they wrench it out of context and therefore torpedo the rest of the Eucharistic teaching in John 6. Now, a verse, a text, a verse of scripture without a context can become a pretext. And what you see by the very context here, Jesus states that I'm going to give you my flesh to eat. That's how I'm going to top Moses, the Eucharist. And then they say, this is a hard saying. He comes back and says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life for you. For the words I say to you are spirit and life. Nowhere in the Gospel of John can you find St. John using the word spirit and life to mean symbolic and metaphorical. That is not the way St. John uses those words in the gospel, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, or the Revelation. Okay, And a good New Testament scholar would know that. That's not the way you handle, that's the way you mishandle scripture. That's Greek mode of thinking, thinking spirit somehow is, is a soulless, bodiless type of thing that has no externals. That's Greek thought invading Hebrew thought rather than the other way around. And... As we know that this verse can't mean that, because after they said this is a hard saying, the majority, the majority of Jesus' disciples left. Now, let's just say here that, that I said to you, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, and that means just what it means. It really says that, and you get all huffy and mad at me and start walking out, which is exactly what happened to Jesus. This is the dividing line. This is the dividing line amongst the very disciples of Jesus Christ between faith and unbelief. Because man can't do this. And even if we kind of expand our imagination to a Superman concept, Superman can't do this. There's only one person could do this. The creator. God himself. He can do this. And it's faith. It requires faith. Incredible faith to believe that this can go on. But he said it explicitly, but everybody's now on the way out. Now, if I really didn't mean this, all I'd have to say is, hold it. Please come back. I made a mistake. I really didn't mean to be taken literal. And his disciples blew away. And then he turns around to 12. He says, okay, what about you guys? You're going to go too? He's not. He didn't say, you just... 
took it wrong. Just take it symbolic. Nobody would have walked away. Jesus stood each time people reacted to this teaching. The hard saying, truly, truly, I say to you. People buck, how can he do this? He comes back again. His disciples leave. They left. He didn't say, come back, I made a mistake. He says, these are the words for your spiritual life. And look at any movement in the church that denies the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And I don't care how dramatic and exciting and exuberant their worship is and their life is. I can predict with 100% accuracy the future. Except you abide in me. You have no life in you. And you're going to wither up, dry up, and die. Until the next guy comes down the street with something more exciting, more dynamic, and more exuberant. And unless that's rooted in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, I can tell you what the future of that denomination or movement is. It's going to wither up, it's going to dry up, and it's going to die. Until the next guy comes down the street and starts his. There's no future. The spirit and life move here. The abiding, enduring, persevering life in Christ, this is where it comes. And so the question to ask is, what is going on within your worship service? As you're speaking to your Protestant friend, what is going on in your worship service that tops the miracle of the manna and tops the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000? If you ask for a certain branch of the Protestant church, the, what's called the Zwinglian view of the Lord's Supper, they will say, well, what tops that? Oh, we do this thing every three months. That's a bare memory of Jesus dying on a cross 2,000 years ago. Uh, well, the Presbyterians reformed. They do a little better. What we have is this thing. Sometimes we even do it monthly where we believe that there's a real spiritual presence present. Okay. But I mean, uh, the real, there's been a real spiritual presence in a, in a lot of things. I mean... Um, is that really kind of greater than, you know, 10 freight trains with 30 cars each? Uh, maybe. Okay. Well, the Lutherans. Maybe. Well, you know, Christ's flesh is really present, but not really any change, real change going on of the elements themselves or anything until you have one answer is just what it says. In fact, I just read a little book that has this Benedictine church in Germany. It has this grand picture of Jesus and all his royal majesty. On the one side is Martin Luther. The other side is Wingley. And it says underneath, Jesus Christ says, this is, no, uh, Zwingli says, this symbolizes my body. Luther says, this will become my body. And Jesus says, this is my body. Who's right? This is, by the way, where Protestantism broke. They wanted to have one Protestant denomination. And it all broke right here. Because Christian unity is talked about in the most profound sense in John chapter 17, which is in its Eucharistic context. And the moment you leave it, you'll never find anything but shattering, splintering, and church splits. Because it's inherent. Because this is the center which holds all the parts together. What is greater going on? That greater thing is the Eucharist. It's just what Jesus says. And it's very clear what Jesus says. Let me just double this up because St. Paul talks basically about the same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he warns the Corinthian Christians about engaging in immorality and at the same time coming to the blessed Eucharist. Hello? He said you can't do both can't live sexually immoral life and come to the blessed Eucharist. You can't do both. And in the process, he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and you might want to turn there, because he basically says in different terms exactly what um, Jesus said in John 6. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all baptized into Moses. Symbolically, Passing through the Red Sea was a preview, a foreshadowing of baptism. Passing through the waters of the Red Sea were indicative of going from slavery to freedom type of thing. It was, it was previewing baptism. And it says all ate the same supernatural food. What's that? Manu, 
right? And drank of the same supernatural drink. That was the water that came miraculously from the rock. It says, nevertheless, most of them God was not pleased with, and they perished. Even as they had these foreshadowings of the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. And so he said, these things were written as warnings to us. And then he goes on to say, verse 15, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? There is one bread, and we who are many are one body. Notice what I've just done for you. I've built an argument from Scripture, got my outline for this whole talk, really right from the sixth chapter of John itself, right from the very events of Jesus' ministry. In other words, it was in the process of the feeding of the 5,000 that it connected with the manna in the Old Testament, and then Jesus uses that to teach on the Eucharist. It's exactly what goes on here. St. Paul goes back to the supernatural food in the Old Testament, didn't keep those who engage in sexual immorality from God's judgment. He's saying this warning is for us because don't you know that the cup of blessing which we bless is a real participation. This word participation, your Protestant friends will know about. You've heard of like koinonia fellowship groups. That word, that's the root here. The idea, the koinonia, this very close and intimate sharing. Paul is saying, don't you know the cup of blessing which we bless is a koinonia, an intimate sharing in the blood of Christ. Don't you know that the bread which we break is the body, a real participation, this koinonia in the body of Christ. We're one with that. And then the very next chapter in chapter 11, when he, when he gives the warning about coming to the Eucharist and not examining one's conscience, he says, if you don't do that, you will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to profane the body and blood of Jesus Christ by coming wrongfully to the Eucharist, and that's if the body and blood of Jesus Christ was there to profane in the first place. Do you see this? And probably the simplest argument, I know my uh, daughter, I was real proud of her the other day. Um, you know, the simplest thing is when Jesus says, this is my body. What is it? It is his body. We can't explain it. And she was taking a music lesson and the owner was a Protestant, had some literature there, uh, some Sunday school literature on the Lord's Supper. She says, oh, I think I'll read it. And she says, this represents my body. Uh-uh, that is not what the Greek says. It says, this is my body. That is a pure, unadulterated dilution of God's word. It says, this is my body. We don't weaken it so it fits our human understanding. Our human understanding bows the knee before Christ in the Eucharist. And we, we admit that we're human beings and that we need something far outside of ourselves to maintain life and holiness. This I've given you what I call the forest view from the manna, from the context of the feeding of 5,000 to something the greater in the manna. But there's something that needs to be done as well. Because as Catholics, we're not just on sola scriptura. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist can be easily argued with one hand tied behind your back from sola scriptura basis. Just read John 6. And don't say you don't take the Bible literally. Okay? You just read that. But on the other hand, we do have sacred tradition. And we do have in the apostolic fathers, who are the earliest of the earliest of the church fathers, we have men who are ordained by St. John, who happened to be the one to write John chapter 6. He ordained them. And men whose lives overlapped the life of St. John, the oldest living apostle, when he was living in Asia Minor. Now, who are you going to listen to if you have a little difference of opinion over John chapter 6? Are you going to listen to the church fathers who wrote the same thing in the 1st, the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, the 8th? And in the ninth century, I have to admit, there was one heretic that came up and denied the real presence for the first significant time in history. And then the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, and then in the 15th, uh, 16th century, the Protestant reformers denied it again. So you have two significant blips, but you went nine centuries without any difference of belief. Are you going to believe the people who knew St. John personally, 
who heard him teach with their own ears, are you going to listen to somebody who came 1,500 years later? Well, listen to what they said. You remember I talked about opening apostolic fathers and seeing a bishop here and a bishop there? Well, this is also what I saw. This comes from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was on his way to be a martyr. This was not, you know, they portray in the Protestant movies as really overweight, glutton of a bishop sitting around, very carnal and worldly. Okay, this man was a bishop, and he said, don't disturb me. I'm on my way to the lions. Don't interrupt this process. All he had to do was pinch a little thing of incense, like almost like light a match, and say, Caesar is Lord, and he's out of there. He says, no, Jesus is Lord, and he's going to the lions. And he wrote seven epistles on his way to Rome to be martyred. And one he wrote in his letters to the Smyrnaeans in A.D. 110. John died in the 90s. This isn't 300 years later a Catholic corruption, a loss of biblical faith. This St. Ignatius, his life overlapped St. John. And this is what he wrote. And if you have bought Jurgens, it's in section 64. Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. 10, AD 110, St. Ignatius of Antioch. St. Justin Martyr, in his book, The First Apology, one of the first apologetics works, apologetics means defending the faith, that we have in the history of the church. It comes to us from the middle of the second century, A.D. 148 to 155. This comes from Jurgen, section 128. We call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to t partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true and who has been washed in the washing, which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration. It's called baptismal regeneration, but we'll talk about that another time. And is thereby living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread, not as common bread, nor common drink do we receive these. But since Jesus our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God, and, both flesh and, and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too... As we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer sent down by him and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished is both the flesh and blood of that incarnated Jesus, St. Justin Martyr. That is explicit and one of the first defenses of Christianity that we have from the ancient church. You see... The fundamentalist, in the fundamentalist scheme, they date the fall of the Catholic Church somewhere around 310, 311, 312 with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. He said the true church was before then. But these were people whose lives were overlapping that of the apostles themselves. This is centuries, two centuries, before they say the Catholic Church went down the tubes. Hmm. You go to Origen in his homilies on Exodus. Why? Exodus is talking about the manna. This is from Jurgens 1490. You are accustomed to the part of the divine mysteries. So you know, when you receive the body of the Lord, you reverently exercise every care, lest a particle of it fall, and lest anything of the consecrated gift perish. It's not ordinary bread. And that's why every particle is maintained. St. Hilary and his work in the Trinity in A.D. 356, and this is from Jurgen section 870. When we speak of the reality of Christ's nature being in us, we would be speaking foolishly and impiously had we not learned it from him. For he himself says, my flesh is truly food and my, my blood is truly drink. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood will remain in me and I in him. That's a quote from where? John 6, and then he concludes, as to the reality of his flesh and blood, there is no room for doubt. 
And you can look in the back of that Jurgens three-volume set on the early church fathers. Look under the sacrament of the Eucharist. Look up the, the real presence. I've just given you a smattering of what comes from the early church. You can ask yourselves, do you like to believe somebody who came 1,500 years after Christ and absolutely ruptured what every church in every part of the world has believed for 1,500 years. Now, I did mention in the ninth century there was one blip. There was one heretic, and God allows heretics to come along so that the church further refines and makes explicit her teaching. And in putting that heresy to rest, there is a declaration of faith in the Eucharistic presence that was written by Pope Gregory VII, and was written in A.D. 1079. And I'm going to leave it here for somebody to get a hold of a copier and make, maybe make it available. Because when you remember the statistics that I just opened with, the fact that Catholics, the vast majority of Catholics attending Mass, don't believe what the church has been teaching, something needs to be done. I'm not particularly a banner person, but I think a banner needs to be made about the size of a semi-truck and placed in every sanctuary across the United States in every Catholic sanctuary. Outside, maybe get a couple of semi-trucks and have big banners of this as people are going in. You get the idea. Put this on TV, get some prayer cards, small ones laminated and printed, and give them out by the hundreds of thousands. Seriously, if we can get this rekindled, the fire comes back into the Catholic Church. This is what he wrote. And I, I just don't, I haven't seen anything that improves quite on this. I believe in my heart and openly profess that the bread and wine placed upon the altar are, by the mystery of the sacred prayer and the words of the Redeemer, substantially changed into the true and life-giving flesh and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And that after the consecration, there is present the true body and blood of Christ, which was born of the Virgin and offered up for the salvation of the world, hung on the cross and now sits at the right hand of the Father. And that there is present the true blood of Christ, which flowed from his side. They are present not only by means of a sign, and of the efficacy of the sacrament, but also in the very reality and truth of their nature and substance. Pope Gregory the Seventh, A.D. 1079. This is what the Catholic Church teaches. This is what Saint John was talking about when he recorded uh, Jesus' words in John chapter six. This is worth everything. This is truly worth everything. And when you lose this, I mean, just to be quite frank, you know, becoming a Catholic is in many ways more difficult than being a Protestant. A Protestant, you kind of like pick a church that kind of fits your spiritual lifestyle. Catholicism is, makes a few more demands, a little more rigorous. And so if this wasn't here, why not just go down the street as thousands are doing? I can give you, actually, I can give you three reasons. The Eucharist, the Eucharist, the Eucharist. You got it. God bless you. Thank you. This CD is copyright Family Life Center International. Duplication is prohibited by federal law and the Catechism of the Catholic Church. For more information about the Family Life Center, please visit our websites, familylifecenter.net and dads.org. Thanks for listening to this recording and may God bless you and your family.